All right, so when we did FRQ one before, instead of having a graph um, as your function f of x, there was a table, and then you would do the first and second differences to figure out if it was linear or quadratic. Do you remember that? And then you would say over equal length input value intervals. Okay, that that's one way they could ask this question. The other way they could ask this question is asking if that function. They'll give you the graph or maybe the table. And then they'll, instead of that, they'll ask, is that function invertible? And so that, that's the new thing. Um, but part, you'll always be given one um, function in table form or graph form, and then one function in algebraic form. So the one that's in algebraic form, I would recommend that you just first, right off the bat, go ahead and put that in your calculator for y1. And then you have to be real careful. Um, like as you go through here, sometimes they're talking about f, which is the graph. Sometimes they're talking about g, which is this exponential function. Okay, I want you guys to put your phones away. Go ahead and put it away. Oh, is that your calculator? We'll get you another calculator. <clears throat> Um, part A1 is always going to be some kind of composition. And so um, it tells you that H, so we have F, that's the graph. We have G, that's the exponential function. Um, G can be any kind of function, but for this test, we're going to do exponential because that's what we've studied in this unit. Um, and then there's H, that's another function. That is the composition of G and F. So um, it tells you that H is G of F of X. <clears throat> and they want you to find h of negative 1, which is g of f of negative 1. All right, now we've done this lots and lots of times. Maybe not necessarily exactly like this, but we've done compositions where we plug numbers in tons. <clears throat> All right, so f is the graph. So what is f of negative 1? 2. 2, okay. So it's the value of the function f when x is negative 1. So that's f at 2. All right, and then g of 2. Um, I honestly don't know if you're going to need to, um, like, actually write out um, putting 2 in for x in g. It won't hurt if you do. Um, it doesn't necessarily say to show the work that leads to your computations or show the computations that lead to your answer, um, but it never hurts to do it. So at this point, to find g of 2, you can type that into your calculator. I like to just um, go to the home screen, and you can see where I did it last period, and then just do y1 of 2. Like we already put that g into the um, calculator. So don't forget, y1 <coughs> is alpha trace. And then and we can evaluate that for any number just by putting 2 in parentheses or whatever number in parentheses. All right, and then we're going to need to be accurate to three decimal places. So in this case, we can, we can write the whole number if you wanted to, or we could round or we could truncate. So you have lots of options there. But it, 0 0.7 is not an option, 0 0.71 is not an option, so we have to at least have three numbers after the decimal point that are accurate. <coughs> Alright, and then for part two, it says to find all real, sorry, real zeros of f or indicate that there are no real zeros. So don't forget which is f and which is g. So f is the graph. What is the zero of f? Three. 
So I would just write a little statement that F has a real zero at X equals three. Or you could say X equals three is a zero of F. There's lots of ways you can word it. I'm pretty sure all they're really looking for is that X equals three, but um, it doesn't, doesn't hurt to practice perfection here. All right, and then for B, B part one says to find all the values of X as decimal approximations for which G of X is equal to 8.2. All right, so G is the exponential function that we already put into Y1. So what I would do on this one is in for y2, I would put bless you, I would put 8.2. And then look at their graph. All right, now we can't just like estimate. Um, we need to be really, really accurate. So you wouldn't trace here. What would you do to find that intersection point? Find the intersection. So it's second trace and then number five, which is intersect. <clears throat> and then you get this little flashing cursor. If they only intersect one time, it's fine if you just hit enter three times. And then as long as this says intersection, then you can be accurate to three decimal places here. I would write a statement similar to um, g of x equals 8.2 when x equals 1.066. And then part two on b, um, we've definitely done this before. I think when we did it before, it was with rational functions and the graph actually kind of led you astray on those rational functions. Um, in this case, the graph does not lead you astray. Um, we want to know the end behavior of G as X increases without bound. So when we're looking at the graph, the blue graph is G. So increases without bound, which side of the graph is that? The right side. So on the right side, what is G approaching? Zero. <coughs> yes, sir. Um, no, thank you. It's negative. All right, so <clears throat> on the end behavior, I would like for you to write a sentence that tells it, but it's absolutely required that you do a mathematical limit. So both is great, but if you just do the limit, I think they'll take it. Um, but if you just write the sentence, you won't, won't get the point. So the sentence would be something like, as <clears throat> x increases without bound, G of X approaches zero. <clears throat> All right, now when you do your limit, there's four parts to the limit. I'll let you guys get that written down. This is important. <laughs> All right, so one part of the limit is just writing lim. All right, what's another part? X approaches, in this case, it's gonna be infinity. So if we're doing in behavior, it's either gonna be X approaches infinity or negative infinity, just depending on increasing or decreasing without bound. All right, what's another one? G good, that's the one people forget. And the last thing? Zero, good. 
So to get this point, you have to have all four parts of that limit. If you put f of x here, you don't get it. So be careful. It's talking about g. You have to make sure you put g there. All right, any questions on that? Okay. Now, c is what we did yesterday, so it should be super fresh in your mind. Um, do you guys think that f is invertible? Yes. So part one is just saying that f is invertible. And then part two is y. So you have to be real careful. We can't say f is invertible because it's a one-to-one -one function. We can't say because it passes the horizontal line test. We have to talk about output and input. So f is invertible. Because, you guys remember? Perfect. For every output value. No, you're right. Each output value. <coughs> of f is mapped from a unique input value. Now, if you did say exactly like you said, every output is mapped from a unique input, that's fine. That's perfect. They're not going to be that picky. <clears throat> okay, what questions do you guys have on this?